Okay, we got to land this plane. So okay. the way I want to land the plane is to get you. <laughs> that is super cool, man. I'm telling it's you. It's very cool. It's, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable. The, yeah. Get you to tell me what the future of this creative thinking will bring to quantum physics. Will yeah. it, is the goal state to turn quantum physics into something as intuitive as classical physics? We're, with a mm. pathways of understanding. That's obvious yeah. that it should do that. This particle pops in and out of existence, of course. Or will it just remain statistically mysterious? And like Einstein said, God does not play dice with units, but maybe God does. God's oh, my a answer's done! <laughs> maybe God is a gambler and just deal with it. Yeah, uh, people have a different... People have different questions about let, about that. So here's another, like if you're a physicist who does quantum theory uh, or you're, you're an experimental quantum physicist and you believe that it, the universe is not statistical, then you're going to design tests that try to get beyond that. But if you think the world is ultimately indeterministic, then at some point you're going to move on. Yeah. Um, but I've already said, I think this is just my guessing, again, from conversations I have with practicing physicists, but thinking about... Quantum mechanics is never going to be intuitive the way classical mechanics is because we as evolved creatures the way we are started doing science in terms of position and like with things we could see and measure and apples and arrows. and We didn't evolve in a quantum state. No. Right. In fact, you could very easily argue that knowing quantum theory is m evolutionarily maladaptive because it's a bunch of nerds like myself sitting around doing problem sets, and here comes the saber-toothed tiger. So it's good for us oh, as a species. Oh, you would be summarily removed from the gene pool. <laughs> yeah, yes. I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I prefer like it's, a it's, classical... It's a good thing for physicists. A classical understanding of the saber-toothed tiger so we wins built, every time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's if that's the only thing that the audience takes away, that's a good one. <laughs> for those who live near saber-toothed tigers. Um, they're extinct, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Biology is not my area yeah. of expertise. Okay, but but so. I, got, I got news for you. Uh, the regular tigers, uh, they don't eat you too. We'll they're stick with the regular they're, tigers. They're good enough. They'll, we they'll have sharks eat, and things. Yeah. It's all good. They'll eat you too. Plus, okay. the, uh, they're on the list for be becoming de extincted, the okay. saber tooth tigers. The fact that we can do that now. <laughs> so cool. Um, so there's a way that quantum is never going to be intuitive to us the way it is. But that's why engaging with these philosophical questions, we're going back and asking, what are we doing when we do this test, when we do tests? Are there loopholes in the logic of how we're doing this? Are there things we can be testing we haven't thought of yet? Um, are we using the word causality or space or time or background? Like, are we using these in a consistent way when we set up our experiments? Um, are we testing our assumptions? Like, um, these conversations, well, we're so wedded to the classical picture of things that Understanding and it's not that, our fault. We of evolved not. that it's way. Very natural, yeah. right? Um, but it also means that we have to do a lot of work to continue unmooring ourselves from that perspective. Ooh, I like that I phrase. Love it. Unmooring. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. okay, yeah. all hands on we deck. Keep doing it. No, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's like you're what, what, really, it's kind of a, you know, an ossification that mm. happens. That's another really good word. You know, Ooh. because of uh, the practice, uh, the practice itself. Yeah. And then what you have to do now is, to, in order that we can become more elastic, this is where the philosophy comes in to help change the thinking altogether so that <laughs> we can go in a different direction. Right. And in the ideal world, there would be more cross-pollination, but also the way we train physicists would be, I mean, because there are a lot, there's lots of philosophy that doesn't really talk about physics or take physics as its input the way philosophy of physics does, you know, ethics. Um, epistemology, um, social political philosophy. These are important areas of philosophy that leave yeah, ethical life. philosophy, religious philosophy, yeah. uh, even economic philosophy. Philosophy of law. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Philosophy of the emotions. Like these things can stay pretty Space far. Space law. That's another frontier where they you need know, some I've, philosophers. I really. I, every Who time owns I meet, the moon? Every time I every time I meet a lawyer, I ask if they're a maritime lawyer because they're going to be the first ones who uh, like <laughs> develop. They're going to be the ones. Um, yeah, a good friend. Has of, your satellite crashed into another satellite? <laughs> that's not the cat. <laughs> No, listen. We whoa, can whoa, get you what you deserve. That's not what we're talking about by space law. Actually, <laughs> it's not far away. I mean, <laughs> there's a nearest trajectory between Earth and the moon. Who's going to please? Is that going to be toll? 
booths along that? Like, who's going to police? My brother is co-founder of, of Carmen Plus, which is an asteroid mining startup. And they're, they have a lawyer As on everyone's the team. brother would be. Yes, we, of all, course. Yeah, we all have that. And what that. they do is super cool. Um, but, um, but, what they're, but they have to think about these questions. Like, how do we... Do we tax stuff that you mine from asteroids? Who owns this stuff? Um, these are really important questions. So yes, um, but that physics training in the U.S. would involve some pausing and stepping back and looking at the history of the field and asking philosophical questions. Is like, there a country that's doing that now? And I we're, think lag there we're are. lagging behind them. I think there are. Um, I, you know, I don't know at the university level, um, but when this was what was really exciting at Helgoland is I met a lot of young, like early career folks in physics at these great labs all over Europe, in China and in South America and some in the U.S. Although, to be honest, most of the labs in Europe are hoping to get some of our best scientists who are leaving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this is a real phone thing. calls have been made. Yes, um, we're mm -hmm. losing some of our top scholars. I wonder what's going on with that. <laughs> But the young generation wants to study this. They are interested in knowing these things because they understand how wedded it is to the to the, the edge of physics that they're asking. So I think if enough people ask for it, like vote with your dollar, right? Mm -hmm. Ask to be taught these questions when you're learning physics. And it will- a, a, a Reminder that when you're young, you're a little more irreverent in your thoughts anyway. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're a little bit less, like you haven't built a whole career in a particular groove. Right, so you can right, sort of- right. Hop over. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least thanks for coming back. Fascinating. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I, 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 I have a good time yeah. conversing with you. Okay, guys. Yeah. Yeah. you're just up the street. I mean, you're That's true. right up there. Uh, City yeah. College is up in 138th Street, yeah. Uh, yeah. right up there in Manhattan, mm -hmm. a few miles north of here. Can I ask one last question, Neil? I guess so, sure. I know you've said, this is personal, and so it doesn't have to go on the air if you don't want, but I know you've said a number of things about philosophy of science and philosophy in general in the past. But you're like you. You seem really genuinely curious about these things. What's that about? I would say my my comments on philosophy have been caricatured. Okay. Um, and so I can be very explicit. There. Okay. I have yet to see someone who has earned a PhD in a philosophy department mm. in the twentieth century mm. contribute materially to our understanding of the physical sciences. Oh, it's been done already, yeah. Um, I, but, I just haven't, I haven't. But, but also, I mean. The, uh, so who was who saying it? Is the, is, is, the purpose, is the philosopher saying that, or is the physicist saying that? The physicists have said that. Okay, like, so there are contributions. What's the single best example? Oh. Um, single best. Adam's got one. But, you're here. No. <laughs> I'm calling on okay. my ask a friend. Okay, ask a phone <laughs> friend. I get a phone a friend. <laughs> phone a friend. <laughs> So Abner Shimoni was a f was a physicist at Boston. Was oh, a also, physicist. So he's he's formally trained in as a philosopher. Abner Shimoni has a, has formal training in physics and in philosophy. But his PhD is in what? Both. What? Mm. Well, there you yeah. go. He has two PhDs. But that's okay. less the point. The point is when you read these mm. papers, the reasoning is philosophical, logical oh, reasoning. Oh, I, just don't get me wrong. Okay. I'm not saying that physics can't be helped by philosophical thinking. I don't know any good physicist who isn't thinking on some level philosophically good. about what they do. Great. And in the field of astrophysics as well. Good. There's always a philosophical dimension. Sure. So the, the precision of my comment about philosophy has just been, what is the value to the physical scientist okay. of someone who's got, spent their entire career, uh, academic training in philosophy? So this and, is, and, and this so that, is so, and I compare modern times to how frequent those contributions yeah. came yeah. a century ago. And so, if this is the this is one guy, maybe there's more examples. But I'm, I'm just contrasting oh, yeah. the utility relative to what role philosophers played so back in the all, day. Yeah. So I said this last time, and it's worth repeating: mm -hmm. saying that something is only important in as much as it contributes to science is a really dangerous point of view. Yeah. I, that said, mm -hmm. it's still contributed to mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. but it, it is worth doing in its own right. But this, um, it is worth doing philosophy of science in its own I'm right. I'm not denying that either. And I oh, don't yeah. think it's also very always quantitative. I don't think there's a hard and fast line between these disciplines, mm -hmm. which is why they were for thousands of years the same pursuit, and why in some arenas we're seeing them 
coming back. Um, because I, I never said it wasn't mm. worth pursuing. You've just been shimonied. <laughs> no, I, I never <laughs> said it was. I, I didn't. I didn't say it wasn't useful, as it's in its own field. I'm just talking about how useful it used to be to physics to have a philosopher in the room, right. and I think that it, utility yeah. is okay. now absorbed by physicists who are thinking philosophically rather than a person whose entire training is in the philosophical world. And so I just have these ha physicists themselves been trained in philosophy. They, they might have, but not as a not, not as very much. Have they taken no, philosophy classes? Probably. Yes. I I actually maybe an intro philosophy class as undergrads, but yeah, I'm willing to probably. bet most of them have not taken a philosophy of science course. Uh, probably most, but some have, sure. So there's a difference between like Stepping back and thinking, which everybody should do if they're mm -hmm. good practitioners of their, but there's just different ways of viewing the world mm -hmm. that, again, I do have training in science and mm -hmm. good philosophers of science will have some engagement with the science itself mm -hmm. and the people who are practicing it now. And when we have conversation, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting and we learn things. It is a dialectic. Mm -hmm. So it may be impossible for those fields to merge again, and maybe that's not the end game, but to have a conversation is very fruitful because I change the way I think about how physics is being done right now. I learn about what they consider the interesting questions, how much progress we've made. It is all very interesting. So why is it this, so then we should, we should promote more of that. I, I've been like four or five different academic institutions and at no time is the philosophy department having lunch with the chemist, the physicist, yeah. and or the biologist. And therein lies the problem. Yeah. yeah. That's what she's saying. That's, mm -hmm. the, That's problem. the problem. Yeah. You know? And then when we do talk to each other, I think, yes, you're going to find people who are like, eh, well, they don't have anything to do with each other. And you're going to find philosophers mm -hmm. of science who are saying a bunch of stuff that has no connection to real science at all. Mm -hmm. And it could still be interesting. But if you're doing philosophy of physics in a way where you're trying to engage, you mm -hmm. have to actually engage. Maybe what I'm observing <laughs> is the empirical fact that this doesn't happen. Yeah. The philosophy departments don't have lunch with the physicists. We should. And so I'm I'm we observing should. that reality yeah. and commenting on it. Yeah. Re so that's all it is. Yeah, that's fair. Because I, I long for the that, day. Now that you have observed it, that reality is now entangled for all. <laughs> So now it has to happen. Actually, friend. that's the observing that would destroy the entanglement. Oh, that's right. They can't do it anymore. I'm so sorry. sorry. This is the, the comedic inversion of that. Uh, at least let me get you, uh, take us out with Einstein's comment on philosophy. Do you remember it? Okay. He probably had several. He made many. Like I got my, Which one are you hoping one. for? The history and philosophy? No, no, it's not that deep. This was very, oh. this is very off the cuff of him. Sometimes when I think about philosophy, I feel like I'm chewing on something that's not in my mouth. <laughs> Where's my book? Hand me my book. Oh, oh, okay. I want to read okay. the quote. Okay. One what? quote from Einstein that's a legit okay. quote. Thanks for reminding me that the Einstein oh. paradox, this is an academic... Uh, it's an academic text. Ac academic text. It does presume some uh, um, um, acquaintance with quantum physics, um, but <laughs> just, you know, a, a scooch. A quantum. Wow. <laughs> the Einstein paradox, okay. the debate of non-locality and incompleteness in 1935. Yeah. The originators this is very, of the like, theory... Thesis. Tight. This is very, that's like a title of a thesis right there. This is intricate work. Yeah. It is intense work. So this is Einstein writing in June to Schrodinger. Um, I'm trying to figure out what on earth quantum mechanics means. Dear Schrodinger, I was very pleased about your detailed letter dealing with our little paper. The actual difficulty lies in the fact that physics is a kind of metaphysics. Physics describes reality, he puts the scare quotes in, but we do not know what reality is. We know it only through our physical description. They are wedded together. Wow. Separable. That's pretty cool. Thus, he called him, he called him Schrodinger, not Erwin? Didn't I say Dear Erwin? No, you said Dear oh, Schrodinger. Oh, Dear Schrodinger. No, no. Just like buddies. Like, if you're playing a sport, you don't say, Hello there, Terrence. <laughs> <laughs>